that our cells are vibrating to. So what else can music do but recognize itself in us as it moves on through? I wonder if it uses us as a muse, if it ahs and oohs like humans do, if it hears the beauty in you. Like <laughs> Good evening, and thank you so much to our panelists and to our Facebook and Instagram live audiences for joining us tonight. My name is Rebecca Brown. I'm the Director of Policy at the Innocence Project, and I'm joined by an esteemed panel to discuss a new reform effort related to one of the leading causes of wrongful conviction, namely false confessions. There are many contributing factors to false confessions and a prominent element, the use of deception by law enforcement during the course of custodial interrogations has been a common feature of interrogations resulting in wrongful conviction. As we begin the conversation, please ask any questions in the comments and we'll try to answer them at the end. You are a huge part of our team and we can't do this work without you and without your support. So please text FREEDOM to 97016 to join our team of advocates for justice and help us to pass these reforms around the country. Here to shed light on the false confession phenomenon are two exonerated men who are also change agents and advocates for the reforms that we're gonna be discussing tonight. Both were tragically only 17 years old when they confessed to crimes they did not commit. Marty Tankliff spent 17 years behind bars for the murder of his parents in Long Island, New York. Terrell Swift spent 14 years behind bars for, or nearly 15, for a rape murder in Illinois, along with his three co-defendants who were known as the Englewood Four. All of his co-defendants had also falsely confessed. 
We're also joined by Professor Laura Nyrider, co-director of the Center on Wrongful Conviction, um, who represented Mr. Swift and who specializes in false confessions. And finally, we're so pleased that the lawmakers who were successful in passing laws in the state of Illinois and in Oregon, the first in the nation to pass police deception or to ban police deception during uh, custodial interrogations are with us tonight. Uh, from the state of Illinois, we're joined by Senator Robert Peters, and from Oregon, Senator Chris Gorsuch. False confessions are prevalent in 12% of the nearly 2,900 exonerations that have been revealed in the United States since 1989, numbering more than 350. And while it might be a counterintuitive phenomenon to most, we hope tonight can help to demystify how false confessions happen. And we also plan to discuss the reforms that we need to put in place to defend against false confessions. So let's first hear from the people who have the most to teach us, Marty and Terrell. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you both so much for being with us tonight. And I also want to recognize that every time you're asked to share your experiences with people, it takes something out of you. And so we just want to express our gratitude to you. Um, it's really because of you that we're able to learn about this phenomenon, and um, and it really has been just your courage and grace throughout this that you know all of us benefit from. Um, and so we are working, of course, together and collectively to prevent this from happening to others. And um, I really wanted to begin with both of you, with uh, Terrell and Marty, if you both wouldn't mind, you know, helping us to kind of set the stage for tonight's discussion and just share a little bit with us about your cases. So uh, let's begin with Marty and then uh, move to Terrell. Sure. Uh, in 1988, I had just turned 17 on August 29th. And on September 7th, I woke up to really what was a nightmare for me. Uh, I discovered that my father was clinging to life and my mother was deceased. Uh, instead of me being able to go with my family to the hospital, I was kidnapped by law enforcement. I was brought 45 minutes away and I was interrogated. I was put into a windowless room uh, with no furniture. And, you know, I was brought up to trust police. And the, the question or the interrogation started off kind of quietly and nicely because they were just kind of curious. And when they weren't getting what they wanted from me, the accusation started. And the interrogation started to get very hostile, verbal. And it got to the point where the lead detective said that my father had been pumped full of adrenaline and identified me and that I should just tell them what happened. They said they found my hair in my mother's hands and that I should just tell them what happened. And it didn't matter what I said to the police. It didn't matter if I said I want a polygraph. It didn't matter if I said I didn't do anything. Their attitude was basically, and there were their statements were, we don't care. Just tell us what we want to hear. And after hours, you start to get to a point where you're mentally drained and physically drained and you just want out. And you start to say things that you know aren't true. And that's what happened in my case. And, you know, there were statements that were made in the interrogation room. But I've always said that, you know, had law enforcement utilized the technology that they had, which they had recording equipment, it never would have been a he said, she said. Because what was interesting about it is that the minute I got out of the confines of the interrogation room and I spoke to a family member, I immediately said they made me say things that I didn't do. And Suffolk County actually had a policy and procedure back in 1988. They actually did do videotaped interrogations, but they chose not to. And the tragedy of this is that, I've said this time and time again, if interrogations, we're talking about the entire interrogation, when the first question was electronically recorded, so many innocent lives would be saved. And in most jurisdictions where we've employed videotaping or some kind of recording, there's been a reluctancy in the very early stages by law enforcement but after they start utilizing it, they're favorite and it saves lives. And, you know, our policymakers and our society should understand that when we torture young men to falsely confess to crimes and we incarcerate them, we're left with leaving the guilty parties to remain free and victimize our communities. And that's not something that we want to really talk about, but that's really the consequences of obtaining a false confession. Thanks so much, Marty. And and, um, and we'll turn to Terrell just to uh, hear a little bit, Terrell, about sort of your encounter with law enforcement and, and sort of what it felt like to be a teenager facing an interrogation for a horrible crime that you know that you didn't commit. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was also uh, 17 years of age uh, as Marty. Um, 
This is like back in March of 1995. Um, I, I wasn't home uh, one night and the police came to my house uh, looking for me. I wasn't there, uh, but I called my mother the next day just to check in and see how everything was doing. And she told me that the police were looking for me, uh, stating that I was hiding someone. Um, didn't know what they were talking about. She said, hey, we'll go over your father's house, give the police a call and find out what's going on. I'm like, okay. I waited till my father got off work, called the authorities and said, hey, my name is Terrell Swift. I'm here, you know, the address where I was, they came um to the address within 15 20 minutes i uh, laid some photographs on the table i uh, asked me did i know any of the guys i didn't know any of the gentlemen i uh, laid some more photographs on, on the table asked me if i knew any of those gentlemen i did not um asked me if i would be willing to come to the police department and said i wouldn't have a problem with it could my father bring me they said no could my uncle bring me they said no because my uncle was there they said, we, we said, well, can they trail you guys? And they said, yeah, we don't have a problem with it. We're taking you to this police department and instead put me in the back of a car and took me to the police department on 51st, which was a totally different direction than where he sent my family. Uh, that was the beginning stages of the deception uh, for me. Um, and then similar to, to Marty, uh, I mean, to Martin, um, you know, you get there, you're a 17 year old kid and you know, you, you're, you, you're, you, you have a sense of trust for the police. Uh, you, you, you would never think that they would do the things that they did to us. Uh, the psychological torture saying that we raped and murdered, uh, someone, someone whom I didn't even know, uh, with four other young men who might not even know them either. Um, we were four, five black youths. Um, on the south side of Chicago that got pretty much swooped up. Um, unfortunately, I see that in, in a lot of the black and brown cases, I just have to say this, it's, it's usually three, four, five of us uh, that they're grabbing uh, at one time. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it, you know, and, and that's something, a whole nother subject. Um, but yeah, I mean, for me, um, what, what matters now is just trying to bring some type of awareness to the, the tactics that they used against us and show that, that that is not a good practice because as Martin stated, the actual perpetrator is still on the street. And in our case, the actual perpetrator stayed on the street and committed more sexual assaults and rapes and murders on other young women and traumatized more families. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for that. And Terrell, you know, I, I think, you know, you made a critical point and I think, you know, we, we should not just gloss over it, which is to say that this is very much an issue of racial injustice. Um, we know that, you know, the state of Illinois, which is known as the false capital, false confession capital of the country, or maybe Chicago is, but that said, the, the data is shocking out of the state of Illinois. Um, when we took a look at it, it was 101 known false confessions, 91 from men of color, men or women of color. So this was 91, 77 black men, 14 Latinx folks. So um, absolutely an issue of racial justice. And I think, you know, absolutely worth focusing on. Um, and that said, um, you know, I think you both just did an extraordinary job of kind of explaining sort of what it felt like. Um, but, you know, one thing that strikes me in, in, in the many years of work that I've done on the false confession phenomenon is this sort of notion um, that people have, right? That some people sometimes say, I would never falsely confess to a crime I didn't commit, right? That would never happen to me. Um, what do you want the general public to understand, right? What do you want, what do you want to say to those people? I've heard that question uh, for years, right? And my reply is, In order for you to, to understand that, you would have to be there. And I wouldn't want you to be there. Uh, again, you put your mind frame and you're with 17 year old kids. You're telling us that we're dying in jail for a crime we did not commit, you know, as a kid. And then they sit you in these dark rooms and have you process that as a child, right? You're 17. What do you mean I'm dying? I, I haven't even lived yet. You know, um, and the deception, it takes, it's so easy for them, to, for the deceit to come in because they see that vulnerability. And then another guy comes in, hey, I believe you. 
and it's right. that simple. But right. to understand, to fully grasp the weight of that, you would have to be there. And I wouldn't want that on anyone. I think we can also simplify it. You know, when I, when I, when I speak to larger audiences on this issue, I ask usually the whole crowd, I go, how many people have siblings stand up? How many people, when you were very young, you and your siblings were home, your parents went out on a, let's say a lamp broke. Your parents came home and said, okay, who broke the lamp? And which one of you in the room didn't break the lamp, but they stood up and said they broke the lamp because they wanted to go out for ice cream. And all of a sudden you see about 50% of the people remain standing. And I go, you just confessed to breaking the lamp that you didn't do for ice cream. I said, you just confessed to something you didn't do. Magnify that, magnify that by a million times. Okay. And now put yourself in somebody's shoes. You know, you've admitted to breaking a lamp for ice cream. I said, imagine when you've somebody, somebody saying, we're going to execute you. We're going to put you in prison for the rest of your lives. We're not letting you out of this room till you tell us what we want to hear. Yeah. It gets to a point where you'll say anything. You know, that's a great segue into my question for Laura, um, because I'd love to hear Laura a bit about sort of the history you know, of interrogations, because, you know, I think we all have heard of the third degree um, and, you know, the fact that, you know, physical torture used to be sort of commonplace in, in the interrogation procedures, um, although I, that's not to suggest that there isn't still, there aren't still aspects of that in interrogations, but very interested in kind of hearing from you about the sort of history of, you know, how we moved um, in this country uh, in terms of dealing with interrogations. Yeah, absolutely, Rebecca. And, you know, I think the history actually helps us understand this all important question, right? Why would anyone confess to a crime that he or she did not commit, right? So the history has everything to do with Chicago, which is where I am right now. Um, back in the day across the country, as you said, about 100 years ago, the main interrogation technique that was used was the third degree, right? Physical abuse. So people would be literally hung outside of windows until they confessed, or they'd be roughed up inside the station house, or they'd have a gun put to their head. And that was commonplace about 100 years ago, until a law professor in Chicago, who actually taught at the same school that I teach at now, Northwestern Law School, uh, in the 1940s and 50s said, you know, these, these physical abuse techniques are barbaric, and they cause false confessions, right? It's so easy for us to understand why anyone would confess to a crime that he or she didn't commit if you're being tortured or physically abused. So his great insight in the, in the 1940s said, let's be progressive, let's be enlightened, let's get rid of these barbaric tactics. Instead, let's develop a set of psychological techniques that will replace physical abuse, right? That's the big insight from the 1940s here in Chicago, right? And at the time, yeah, it was very progressive, very enlightened. Those techniques, that set of psychological techniques that were developed here almost 75 years ago, are still in use today around the country in all 50 states, right? In fact, I guarantee as we're sitting here today, I guarantee someone is being interrogated right now using these techniques and they're the techniques that we heard Martin and Terrell describe, right? The way psychological interrogation works, it's a two-stage process. The first stage is about reducing a suspect down to hopelessness. So they bring you inside the interrogation room, they cut you off from your parents or your sources of support, your friends, everybody else, you're alone in the room, and they tell you the case against you is rock solid. You're caught, you're cornered, you're trapped. Um, we found your DNA at the scene. We found your fingerprints on the gun, even if that's not true. Police were, are in, in most states now, not Illinois, Oregon, thanks to these incredible leaders who are with us tonight, but police are allowed to lie about evidence during interrogation in order to make you feel hopeless, cornered, trapped. They say they've got evidence against me. They're not listening to me protest my innocence. What am I gonna do, right? Then comes the second stage of interrogation. Once that person feels cornered, trapped, hopeless, you offer confession as a way out, right? So like Martin and Terrell were saying, if you don't confess, you'll face the death penalty, right? Or you'll face life in prison. But if you do confess, if you do cooperate, you express remorse, right? People will want to help you. The judge will understand that you're a good guy, a good woman, a good person, right? And it's going to go so much easier for you, right? That's how these psychological techniques work to extract confessions. They are very, very powerful techniques that are very good at, at getting true confessions. 
but they are so powerful that they also get false confessions all across the country. These techniques rely on deception from front to back, from beginning to end. And that deception is now identified as a huge risk factor for false confessions, the same way that physical abuse was back in the day. You know, it's so interesting that you say that because, you know, just also thinking about, you know, protections that, you know, would be available to people, like including counsel, right? Innocent people typically don't ask for that, um, right? They don't ask for counsel because they think it will all be sorted out. So, you know, and, and oftentimes folks that, you know, actually did commit the crime will will seek that protection. So it's it's a bit perverse, right, that that oftentimes, you know, innocent people who would most benefit from an attorney in that moment, right, are not seeking that because of the trust, frankly, that they hold in law enforcement. They don't believe that they, there will be that kind of deception. So, I you know, I think um, it's just uh and, and, and also just wanted to return a little bit to Marty again and Terrell. Um, you both described a little bit about the deception that was used. I know, Marty, you mentioned that they talked about the presence of your hair um, in your mother's hand. Um, if you could speak a bit about sort of the, the scope of the deception used during your interrogation, um, you know, sort of what were those examples of, you know, false evidence that they were presenting to you? So, in addition, so my father never woke. Uh, my hair wasn't in my mother's hands. They also said that they, the, the, the issue about me taking a shower, they said they tested all the traps and they didn't believe me. Um, they said that the knife that was discovered uh, had pink substance on it, which meant that it was actually the murder weapon when the pink substance was actually watermelon. They said the blunt force instrument was a dumbbell that was found in my room. And the dumbbell was completely examined microscopically down to, I think, like a millionth of a centimeter or whatever. And there was absolutely no trace evidence whatsoever. And every issue that the police that I confess to as far as factually, even stuff about things in my life, uh, it all panned out not to be true. Uh, you know, some of the physical evidence that actually came out was that the people who were responsible for the crimes wore gloves. And there was never gloves mentioned in my confession because the confession that came out was only evidence of what law enforcement knew that morning from their visual walkthrough of my house. It wasn't based on actual facts. And it's something that I've always said is that if they would have recorded that interrogation, uh, you know, we would have saw how long it actually lasted because I remember, you know, going into police headquarters when it was light out. And I remember not leaving till it was dark out. Uh, and, you know, nobody really knows how long the interrogation took place because Suffolk County chose not to follow their own rules. There was no proper record keeping. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, it's problematic because the you know, tragically, the Supreme Court allows law enforcement to lie in Suffolk and Suffolk has a huge history of obtaining confessions. I think it's probably the number one homicide division in the country for confessions. I think they were at their highest point. I think they had 99% confession rate, uh, but on average, it was like 90 to 98% for years. Mm. And Terrell, um, I don't know if you wanted to kind of speak a little bit about that deception and, and what you were experiencing. Yeah, I mean, again, the first lie was you sent my family. The well, first lie was you said I was hiding someone. You, you're looking for me. You're lying to me and my family saying that you're looking for me for saying I'm hiding someone, right? Then, you know, you lie to my family. Uh, but in, as far as in the interrogation room, it was, you know, everything that I that I wrote or I said in the false confession was things that I heard from them. You know, they, you know, it was like all of that was a lie. You, she was, you know, every, it was like, it's like everything, Rebecca. It's like it's so much. It's like, it's like where do I even start, right? It's like because every single step was a complete lie, you know. It's like everything, and it's it, it, it's in my case, it was you know it was a, a sexual case, and you know there was DNA uh, involved, and you have five kids that say that they rape someone, five young teens. 15, 16, 17, and no DNA. Like, we're so smart to leave not a trace of DNA, but so stupid to sign a confession. You, you know what I mean? It's like, come on. You know, it's like 
everything was tragic. You know, everything, everything was all a lie. Uh, our whole arrest, everything up until us finally getting exonerated. Um, yeah. You know, it's extraordinary because, you know, as you're describing this to me, right? I mean, it's so clear, right? That, and, and just as you're talking about this, right? We're, we're talking about like pretty unreliable confessions at this point, right? Yeah. As you yeah. said, that, they, that you would produce no physical evidence <laughs> um, with five people, right? And yeah. so, you know, it brings me to my next question to Laura, right? Which is really, you know, do courts consider the reliability of confession evidence um, before they let it in? and let fact finders like judges and juries hear it. Do they consider that? Right, so misconception number one is that no one would confess to a crime that he or she didn't commit. <laughs> and misconception number two is that if that were to happen, a court would handle it and would throw out that confession. But that, that isn't how that works, right? So when any of us are inside the interrogation room, the protections that we all as Americans have come from the Fifth Amendment to the US Constitution, right? Everybody's heard of the Fifth Amendment. You take the stand in court, you don't wanna incriminate yourself, so you plead the Fifth, right? The Fifth Amendment gives us all the protection to not be forced to incriminate ourselves. We can't be forced to confess, but that's the only protection that that amendment gives us, right? It doesn't protect us against confessing falsely. It only protects us from being forced to confess whether that confession is true or false which is why when you hear arguments in court or maybe on TV about confessions, the argument always is, well, this person was coerced into confessing, right? This, per this confession was involuntary, right? Against somebody's will. Those are the only arguments that courts are allowed to consider when they're deciding whether to admit a confession. So Terrell's case is a great example. In, in your case, Terrell, Despite the confessions, right, you were all charged, well, based on the confessions, you were all charged, but before trial, DNA testing came back, conclusively proving that you and your co-defendants were not the perpetrators. Yeah. That's a classic example of the kind of evidence that courts are not allowed to consider when deciding whether or not to admit a confession. That's why reforms like, like what we're talking about today are so crucial because they refocus the discussion on reliability. You know, right. And, you know, and I think to kind of get to the heart of, you know, whether or not a, you know, a confession is even reliable, you know, you really need to have a record of that, right? So the first generation of reforms that, you know, uh, organizations like the Innocence Project and the Center on Wrongful Conviction sought to pursue was to record the custodial interrogation from start to finish, right? Not just at that point in time where the confession was prepared and the person was ready to confess and then they turn on the tape and now you have this you know, perfectly tailored confession with no sense of what led up to that confession, right? So the first uh, reform that we really sought to, to pass, right, around the country was really foundational, right, which was the recording of interrogations. And, you know, Laura, I'd, I'd love your thoughts about kind of why this reform is so important and how it helps uh, juries and judges to assess whether or not, you know, a confession was, well, even voluntary. Sure. Well, it goes back to the history, right? So in the 40s and 50s, you know, we came up with these psychological techniques that are still in use today. And for decades, we went along and said, isn't that great? We fixed the problem of false confessions, right? Because we don't use the third degree widely any longer. But a couple of things happened, right? And the first big thing that happened was that DNA technology was invented and started being used to test the reliability of these confessions. Right? And all of a sudden, we're realizing that these confessions are being proven false much more often than we ever could have imagined, and under circumstances that are different than what we had hypothesized, right? Because we had thought that these psychological techniques wouldn't result in false confessions. They definitely do. And that's what we started learning from DNA. So then, thanks to the leadership, like you say, of the Innocence Project, the Center on Wrongful Convictions, organizations across the country, we started saying, well, look, if these confessions are being proven false, we need to know what's happening inside the interrogation room. We have to pull back that cloak of secrecy, open the door, let in the light and figure out what's going on that's making this really counterintuitive thing happen that's causing innocent people to confess to crimes they didn't commit. And that's the genius of electronic recording laws, right? Laws across the country in 28 states now, I think, 
uh, requiring in thirty. Thirty. All right. All right. That's the best news I've heard all night. So now 30 states, right, require interrogations to be video or audio taped in some way, the whole thing, not just the statements at the end. But that means we've got 20 states left to go. Um, so that's an important reform to push as well. But that's that's laid the foundation for what we're talking about here today, because now we have these videotapes. We can go in and analyze and study and research, and we can identify these deceptive interrogation tactics as a major risk factor for false confessions. Thank you. And, you know, interestingly, um, a little known state senator at the time in Illinois named Barack Obama sponsored the first law in the country to record custodial interrogations. And sitting in that same Senate seat uh, today is Senator Robert Peters, who is the sponsor of the first law in the nation that banned police deception during interrogations of people under the age of 18. So, you know, it was only appropriate that Illinois was the first law state to pass this law, given its unenviable status as false confession capital of the country. Um, but, uh, you know, Illinois has produced just so many false confessions. And so, Senator Peters, I, I wanted to hear from you about sort of what motivated your sponsorship of this legislation. And, and if you could share a little bit, you know, about how it was received by other lawmakers when you first introduced it. Yeah, um, so thank you. And I actually just want to thank Marty and Terrell uh, for being on and for everybody who's organizing around um, these issues. I think that we need to expand the scope of what it means to have public safety in our community, in our world. Um, and part of that, I think, lies at being able to trust um, the government or trust the state uh, to be a steward that looks out for you. So on a macro level and on a principally big level, um, it was really driven by the idea that if it's okay to lie to a child, uh, and that is literally part of a state action or a state apparatus, that fundamentally uh, people will not have faith and trust not only in the state, but also in each other. Um, you will you You essentially isolate people to such a extreme degree of individualism, that that's not helpful for anybody and doesn't look out for anybody. A second thing on a more like a smaller personal level is I, I had a privilege. My dad was a civil rights lawyer and a criminal defense attorney, but I've been interrogated by police and told all types. I'm not, we're live. I can't curse. So my foul mouth is, I'm going to restrain it. Um, but uh, all types of BS. Um, and the fact is that they, they were kind of shocked to find out that I knew I was going to have my dad come in um, and I'm not going to say anything to them. But the amount of extreme pressure, and you heard it from Marty and heard it from Charlie, the amount of extreme pressure that's put on you um, to say anything, to get out of that space is, is disgusting and it's vile. Uh, so fundamentally, um, it's the macro level of being able to trust and invest in each other and believe in each other and not to practice the worst forms of cynicism about your neighbor, your friend, your community. And on a micro level, it's that very experience, the very idea of being under that much pressure uh, and to do that to people over and over again is not about making community safe. It's about getting a win. Uh, it's about seeing uh, something zero sum about being able to have a victory in your, you know, whether it's with your, your coworkers in the police department or wherever I might be. And the fact is, if you're having a public safety program based off of wins and losses, it's not about what human people need in order to get by in life. And if we don't move to focusing on what people need and we're stuck here, it's only going to make matters worse. It's only going to make more and more trauma happen over and over again. So on both a macro level, uh, on a broader ideological level, and on a smaller personal level, it's about the idea of trust and the idea of confronting injustice and the amount of pain and trauma that so many people are having. If you listen to Marty, I think Marty, you said 1988, and Terrell, you said 1995. That is during a period of rapid, tough on crime ramp up. The very idea of not being able to uh, see in each other uh, the amount of love and care that we need is literally ramping up during that period of time. Uh, and in Illinois and in Chicago, I mean, we're a, a city that produced John Birch, right? This is not only confession, but torture. Uh, that third rail uh, is something that's historically tied to the city. 
that we fundamentally needed to move away from. So I, it, it, this was a, a passion uh, on a broader level of what it means for us to have a good, safe and connected communities uh, where we can believe and trust in each other. And it is not about having this zero sum game of win and losses uh, that does nothing to keep people safe. So true. And, and Senator Peters, how, how do you how do you think um, your colleagues responded to the proposal when it was introduced? To be very frank, I think they were initially very skeptical. Um, mm -hmm. And to be just to, to be honest, I mean, we we in the Black Caucus passed four historic pieces of pillars. Um, one of them involved in a large criminal justice package. Um, I think that as people learned about the bill, and this is where, in all honesty, it's not just the fact of the work that I did on the floor or that uh, Rep Slaughter, I believe, did in the House, but also the advocates having conversations with people and moved to the point where it was uh, a bill that I was very anxious to be able to move to becoming a bipartisan bill with broad support. Even the um, minority leader, the Republican minority leader in the House uh, came on as a, a co-sponsor and spoke of the bill. So it just, it, there's a few things there. People might be skeptical, but what you realize is that when you take organization uh, and you you have those conversations with people, it can fundamentally shift uh, the conversation that I like to say under the dome and within the Capitol. Right, right. Really helpful. And, you know, inhaling from Oregon is Senator Chris Gorsuch, whose bill, I believe, was signed within hours of the Illinois law. So maybe the time difference makes it a tie. I'm not sure. Um, Senator Gorsuch, oh, no, there's disagreement. We'll never know. Um, but I will say, um, I, Senator Gorsuch, I was so moved that as a former uh, police officer yourself, you sponsored a similar bill in Oregon. And, um, and I was just interested to hear sort of personally kind of what moved you to work on this issue and did you find similar support from uh, police and sheriffs in Oregon? Well, uh, thank you for having me, by the way. Um, as you've already said, I worked for uh, law enforcement. I was a Portland police officer uh, from 1980 to the end of 87. Uh, and during that time, we were definitely trained in these techniques. And, and while I certainly um, used that against some um, suspects, it was never something that I thought was a great, uh, great way of doing things. And after I left, I've been a teacher in criminal justice since, uh, well, 97. Um, but, you know, the more I studied this, the more it became apparent to me that these sorts of tactics are extremely damaging and can lead to some very counterproductive results. Now, what led me first to, we did it in three bills actually, and uh, Senator Peters was just talking and you were just talking about the question of recording. Uh, we found first off that we weren't recording juvenile um, interrogations. And it's like, really? We, mm -hmm. we recorded them for adults, but we weren't doing it for children. And the one thing I think everyone can agree on is that when you have that documentation, when somebody says this wasn't done correctly, well, we just can simply go back and look. And so sometimes it may lean towards law enforcement. Other times it leans away. But I think it makes the process cleaner and more accurate. So the political decision was let's approach this incrementally and uh senator peters i'm sure you know too when uh, when you try to bring a huge change forward it can really be difficult uh as we like to talk about the heavy lift so we decided uh my office and some of our supporters uh by the way we were helped very much by um folks uh in the central or not the central, sorry, the Center for Wrongful Conviction. In fact, uh, Laura and Rebecca and um, many others, Stephen Drizzen, uh, helped us with these projects. Uh, so the first thing we did was we approached it from, we want all kids that would, if they were an adult, have committed a felony to be, inter uh, when they're interrogated, we want it documented. And what's really interesting is that the committee chair for, um, <laughs> for judiciary at the time actually tried to kill the bill mm. and he's like nope no nope, maybe you could try next session um and 
I talked to the uh, the Speaker of the House, and the Speaker made sure that the bill did move forward and did come out of committee. So, um, you know, Speaker Kotek did a great job on that and, and assisting us in saying, no, I think this is a really good bill and it should move forward. Um, and then it, it we managed to pass it in the House and then in the Senate. So when that was completed, then it was like, okay, now in the next session, which was 2019, so we have every other year we have the long session. So in 2019, we ran a bill that said, now if they were charged with what would be a misdemeanor, you have to record. And the idea is now anytime a juvenile is interrogated, we will have that electronic documentation so that we know. Getting back to the question of of data, for instance, um, you can't really fully evaluate things in, unless you have the data. And I don't know about I don't know about Illinois, but the one thing that we heard opponents say over and over is, "Oh, those things don't happen in, in Oregon." It's like, well, we're like Disneyland. I mean, it's some sort of fantasy land where we would never have that happen in our state. Um, but I think that's you know, oh, it's my state, and I don't believe these things happen. So we did that, and then this last session we were able um, to once again move forward and and again with the help of many of you uh, we were able to um, basically get the bill passed that said very much like in illinois sorry but you don't get to deceive kids to get a confession and this all started this this oh, this set of three bills for me started uh, because of the story I was uh, I encountered of uh, some kids that actually were being um, accused of a crime that they didn't commit and the lying was going on and the attempt to isolate the kid from the uh, parent all sorts of things and some of the parents going I'll just tell the truth and others going no, no, no. Remain silent and get a lawyer. I mean, I, I tell all of my students, remain silent and have a lawyer. That's what the Fifth Amendment is for. Um, so that's how we came to be involved in this. The interesting thing was that we were able to get um, the police unions to neutral. And uh, Kevin Campbell, who is the lobbyist for um, the chiefs and sheriffs, really worked with us to get it to a point um, where the chiefs and sheriffs actually supported the bill. And so uh, we were really, really, really fortunate. The other thing is uh, we had the context, especially in this session, of all of the, you know, the tremendous uh, outcrying after the Chauvin assault mm -hmm. um, and killing um, that just a horrendous thing. And that really led to a lot of push in Oregon and I'm sure in Illinois and other states for police reform. Um, so that was part of this too. And our, um, uh, we have a, a People of Color Caucus, they were very helpful in helping to move this forward. Because again, we know that a lot of times, not entirely, but a lot of times, it's kids of color that are getting sucked into this a system. But the one thing I wanted to say is, uh, going back to Marty and then uh, uh, Terrell, we know now that brain chemistry is such that the sophistication, the adult sophistication, really doesn't fully develop until you're about 25 years old. So to put a 17, 16, 15-year-old in that position and go, well, you know, they look like adults. They must think like adults. It's not true. And we know that now. So that I think it's incumbent upon us to say, wait a minute, we know that's not true. Now, like I said, our next step will be to say, because I had several people say this to me. Well, Chris, why, why isn't it about adults too? And it, and it was like, again, incremental steps, right? Uh, but the one thing, if anything, that was really interesting was that in this go round, my caucus actually wanted to make it bigger, wanted to expand it more. And, and it would have run into so many problems and we would have run out of time trying to sort them out that we stayed with where we were. Um, and then it, it moved forward and it, it had to go 
through rules plus the regular committee. So it had a lot of hoops to go through, but it passed quite quite well. I'm very pleased with it. As are we, and uh, and just uh, wanted to kind of touch on a point that you were making, right? Which is that you know, in many instances, we have to approach this work incrementally as much as we. Yeah. You know, and as an advocate, of course, I'm always feeling frustration, like, can't we do it right. this one, right? But um, so, the, so I guess a question for both of you, both senators, is, um, you know, sort of how would you like to build on this reform? And or, or were there provisions that you wish you could have gotten in this proposal that you mm -hmm. didn't get and, and because of politics? And, and how would you like to build on it in the future? I'm going to just lift up what uh, Senator Gorsuch said, which is, uh, I got asked, you know, I go on like WGN radio or something and they're like, well, what about adults? And then I'm sitting there like, I don't know if this is supposed to be a gotcha, but yeah, I'd, I'd also not believe that we should be trying to deceive adults. Um, because especially for me, if you fundamentally believe uh, we need to actually have some sort of trust and faith in each other and not this sort of um, individualized cynicism about people, then you can't say that you're okay with lying to adults during interrogation. Right. So yeah, I, I think to to lift up what Senator Gorsuch said is like the next step is, all right, now it's just adults we have to go to to next to make make some change happen. No, I agree with that. And the incremental thing, I mean, it is, Rebecca, you're so right. It's like, we have these great ideas and then we realize uh, politically, the reality is it'll have to come in chunks and it's very, it is very frustrating, but um, I think definitely for myself as well, I agree totally with Senator Peters that we need to now approach this in terms of adults and of course, spread this from more states than just uh, Illinois and Oregon, um, absolutely. Well, that is so helpful. And I'm gonna now turn to some questions from our audience um, and, uh, one, the one question comes from Michelle from Facebook who asks, in regards to brain development and juvenile justice, are there legislative acts in the pipeline which take into account the brain development stages by mm -hmm. age? And um, yeah, so it sounds very similar to what we were just discussing. Right. I, 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 can, I can answer in Illinois, there's been a push constantly to change um, the age, particularly to our juvenile justice system. Um, and, uh, I, I tie, try to also tie in our youth and care, our DCFS with, um, when it comes to the criminal legal system, that they're actually more tied together. Um, and those are always pushes, but like has been said, you, you're essentially, you, you need to, to, what makes things happen is a combination of outside and inside game strategy, right? So. We, there's a lot of ideas that we want to see changes on and sometimes they have only outside pushing or they only have inside pushing but they need both and as senator gorsuch said about oregon right what happened coming out of 2020 in that crisis that was that was a clear example of the outside and the inside came together in illinois similarly happened when we passed the the pillars that led to not only just the beginning of the year in january when that passed and got signed but also throughout session, which included uh, our bill that banned deception, right? Like those things all came from a combination of outside and inside strategy. And I think that we need to continue to build off of that and understand that they each play some role. And right. uh, what I will say is first off, I think uh, Senator Peters is absolutely right on that. The second thing is in uh, Oregon with the Oregon Youth Authority, um, we have some very uh, progressive policies there that have been developing, and I expect that to continue. And the one thing, there has been a lot more emphasis on the concern around like brain chemistry and brain development and all of that, um, and trying to make um, the facilities for those few kids that actually are held in, uh, in a custody situation um, you know, get the right sort of treatment. And they're trying to approach things in a, trying to even change the uh, the environment so it doesn't look like a prison, mm -hmm. uh, which I think the environment is a huge, huge piece of this. The, but the other thing is we now have it so that let's say you're 17 and you get a sentence that will last for like four years. Mm -hmm. 
what we now do is we keep the kid in the juvenile system, even though they pass 18, and we don't transfer people over to the Department of Corrections for adults until they turn 25, because there's a concern about the psychological impacts of that and that they can get better treatment on the juvenile side. Great. That's really helpful. And, you know, Laura, this is a question for you. Before I get to that, though, I do want to just note for folks that uh, Terrell had to catch a flight, so I didn't want folks to be concerned. Um, and we are so grateful to him for joining us for the short time that he could. So I um, just wanted to note that. But um, a question for you, Laura, which is how long can interrogators question a minor? Is there a limit? I've heard of interrogations that last for over 16 hours. So thanks to Albert for that question. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. And I think I'm seeing a lot of comments out there. By the way, I just want to shout you all out, all the people here in support of my client, Brendan Dassey. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you for fighting him as we are continuing to do. You know, Brendan's case is a good example of the fact that there are so few rules that actually govern what happens inside the interrogation room. He was a 16 year old special education student who was questioned four times over a period of 48 hours with no lawyer presence. The first uh, go round, his parents weren't even notified that he was being questioned, right? And this went on and on and on until of course he confessed to a crime, but you don't have to be a lawyer to know he didn't commit, right? A crime that he wasn't even able to describe without being told the answer. There are so many risk factors for false confession out there that are yet to be addressed because we're still learning about this phenomenon, still studying it. Um, but that's why we're so grateful, not only for the leadership of yourself, Senator Gorsuch, Senator Peters, people who are, who are in the room, like you were saying, Senator Peters, who can make a difference, but also for just ordinary everyday folks who know people, yeah. right? Who, who are vulnerable, uh, who remember what it's like to be a teenager or a child, right? Who, who know somebody um, who, who maybe might be manipulable and who has the compassion and common sense and human decency to care about doing the right thing. That's what this movement and this movement is about. That's why we're all here tonight. Um, so thanks to everybody for being here. And yeah, we're gonna keep on fighting to make sure these rules change and to help everybody who's been a victim of them. Uh, and if I could just add one thing, um, Senator Peters was talking earlier about the whole get tough movement coming out of the eighties and into the nineties. What's really crazy about that uh, was the claim that juvenile justice was not dealing properly with most kids. It turns out, if you look at it, it was only a small subset of very hardcore offenders that weren't being dealt with properly. And everybody else was basically undergoing uh, experiences in the juvenile justice system that were appropriate. But this excuse then was used to say, oh, now we got to get tough and we've got to be very tough on all of these kids. Um, and we had John DeLulio saying, oh, we're going to have these super predators and, and, and just absolutely insane statements about kids. So um, but that idea, nothing works. It, it was so miscast. Uh, it made the problem worse. I, I know we have like only so much time, but like if I could piggyback off of this, because it's, you know, it gets, I think that um, it's important to remember as we head into what I think is a reaction to um, the organizing that happened in 2020, the uprisings that happened in 2020, where um, I think for many of us, we saw it as a sort of a new hope to get really nerdy about it. And I would say 2021 has felt like the empire strikes back in many ways, like as, we, as this summer has happened. And it's important to remember that it is almost always entirely a political project. Um, these things aren't divorced from the politics. We don't need to get into that right here, right now. But it is important to remember that oftentimes it's a political project, it's an ideological project. Uh, and the conversations about safety, self, liberty and freedom are something that we're always constantly grappling with and fighting with. And so when we think as we move into next year, which is in itself uh, going to be very political, it's going to be a midterm year at the federal level and so many other places that we will see people try to attack the work we've done now for, you know, making someone's job harder or whatever it might be that they might say, 
And it's important to note that it's not data or grounded in reality of what it does to keep communities safe. It's part of a larger political project. And I tell my colleagues, particularly who are in more uh, moderate spaces, that if you react to it, it will only make things worse. They want your reaction. If right. you hold back from reacting and you you got, you put your narrative out there, um, you can you know somewhat inoculate yourself from what they want from you. It's like a bully. They want to keep picking on you, and the more you react, the more they're going to keep going. Really helpful. And um, I'm going to um, end with a question um, from Latoya, who asks. Is there a national resource that has a listing of helpful laws and or rights by state that can help young people better understand the laws in the states that they live in? And um, I'm going to turn this over to Laura, but one thing that we do have on our website, innocenceproject.org, is a compendium of all of the reporting of interrogation laws um, and also uh, the two new laws in Illinois and Oregon that ban deception. Um, so there is, um, you can, um, look at our website and look by state. Um, there's a scroll down that says, how is my state doing? And you can find not only um, a description of the law that is passed in, in your jurisdiction, hopefully, um, but also a link to that statute and you can read it yourself. Um, but I don't know, Laura, if you had other resources you'd like to share. Absolutely, it's a great question. And I think, you know, for all of us, as we sort of learn collectively together about what we can do to fight wrongful convictions and false confessions, Education is, is such an important step. Of course, the Innocence Project website is a wonderful resource. Um, the Center on Wrongful Convictions website is about to relaunch, so stay tuned. We're going to have a lot of, of great data and information there, including some specifically uh, geared at how to protect our kids. Um, and th the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers also has a wonderful website full of maps. So you can, If you're from the U.S., you can click on your state and find out what the state of play is in your affair and what the state of affairs and play is in your state so that you can get going in, in organizing and around your own community right use that education that you that you've undertaken right write to your local policymakers write letters to the editor talk to your neighbors talk to the, the parents of your, your kids at school talk to everybody you can about the need to make change. Post on social media, post on Facebook, post on Instagram, get involved with events like this, get pol politically active in your community because it's together, again, together, we are gonna make these changes that will protect kids, that will protect adults, that will protect all of us from wrongful convictions. And one way to interrupt that narrative, I'm sorry, um, that Marty was talking about, this idea of uh, people still being out there to commit terrible offenses that it does no good to can wrongfully convict people. And so you can approach the inevitable, you don't want us to be safe by saying, well, actually I do want you to be safe because we're not solving anything or making people safe by catch saying that we caught the wrong person. More of a common sense approach and I think public safety approach that right. you know, if, we, if we employ proper techniques, proper precautions, will prevent innocent people from being arrested, convicted, and really, you know, will train people to do the jobs the right way. Right. It doesn't make sense to rush to judgment, rush to get somebody to get a confession, and let the perpetrators remain free. If we spend a little more time investigating crimes or alleged crimes, uh, we may not have as many wrongful convictions, which would ensure that we wouldn't have that many more guilty people remain free and commit these crimes. And, you know, I've been working with the Innocence Project for almost 11, 12 years. And to me, it just makes no sense why we don't have 50 states who have bills that were just passed in Oregon and, and Illinois. It just, it, it's illogical because I think it's such a common sense understanding that, you know, we should protect children. Uh, you know, if, if, if I lied to somebody in the IRS, I could be charged with a crime. If I right. lied during an FBI interview, I could be charged with a crime. Right. So it makes no sense why law enforcement are able to lie about anything. And if they're actually doing their jobs, they're doing it properly, there really should be no need to lie to anybody, whether it's a child, whether it's an adult, whether it's anybody. And I think what we need to do is kind of step back and refocus the attention, refocus the training of law enforcement, because when you employ the proper tactics, the end results are much better.
Yeah. Well, Marty, I think none of us could have said it better, but um, what I will say is you and I have a lot of work to do this year here in New York in the Empire State where there has been a bill introduced, Senate Bill 324 by Senator Delnor Myrie um, to uh, ban deception, not only for young people, but also for adults. So I look forward to working with you this year here in New York and for all of the folks that are out there um, around the country, there will be similar efforts in multiple states. We've already heard from states around the country interested in doing the same kind of legislation sponsored by our champion, Senator Peters and Senator Gorsuch um, in their states. So um, with that, we encourage everyone to please text FREEDOM to 97016 to join our team. When you join our team, um, you will be working collaboratively with the Innocence Project, with the Center on Wrongful Conviction on um, various proposals around the country. We could not do this without you. Um, and we, I, I just cannot thank this esteemed panel enough. We are so grateful for all of you um, to join us tonight. And of course, to Terrell, who is hopefully flying safe somewhere. So um, thank you so much. And um, really just could not be more lucky to have you all with us tonight. So and thanks to our audience. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Mm -hmm.